Hello, Mr. Han, and we, we would like to have an interview with you about translation. Great. Uh, so, the first question. Was it, was it always a dream of yours to become a translator? Um, I feel I probably should say yes, but that would be lying, unfortunately. Um, I had no intention of being a translator. It was an accident, um, which I'm beginning to come to terms with now after 10 years. Um, a friend of mine who worked for a publishing house asked me to read a book for her, just to tell her if it was any good, because it was in Portuguese. And I read it and said, oh, this is wonderful. You must publish this. And she said, OK, do you want to translate it? And I went, sure. Um, not thinking, of course, that this was a serious thing. Um, and I mean, obviously, it was, a, it was a stupid answer. It was a terrible answer. And I translated that one book kind of as a favor for a friend. And then a few years later, she said, I do another one. Yeah, I do one more book. And then after that one, suddenly they came one after another. So no, I had no, I had no intention of, of doing this. And so it happened back since it also happened very easily. I feel very guilty because a lot of my friends are really trying to get into this job and it just kind of appeared in front of me. So I, I try not to be too ungrateful. Um, what was your idea about translator, translation before you engaged with it and what changed later? I think I've always read quite a lot in translation, which wouldn't be unusual in this country, but it is relatively unusual in, in the UK because we publish very little in translation. Um, I think I always had a relatively wide uh, horizon of what I used to read. I don't think I thought about the process very much. I don't think I thought about the skills very much, but I was at least aware that there is this huge forest of, of writing from all over the world. Um, I think a lot of people in the UK have much less of a sense, partly because the proportion that we publish translated as opposed to not translated is so tiny that it's possible to have a very full, very e extensive reading experience without ever reading a translation in your life. Um, so I think I was very conscious that there were these things that existed, if you see what I mean. Um, and I grew up reading translations as a kid, like I think everyone does in England. Um, but I don't think I really gave much thought to why it was interesting or why it was difficult, which is possibly good because I was, since I, I was asked to do my first translation and said yes kind of without thinking about it, if I'd thought about it, I might have said no. If I'd thought, oh, that's really difficult, and my Portuguese probably isn't good enough, and my English probably isn't good enough, and maybe, I don't know. Um, so fortunately, I was, I was more or less ignorant, which allows me to go, yeah, sure, why not? How hard can it be? And then discover when it's too late. That's really interesting. Uh, is there a translator that you admire, or is there anyone that you have as a role model? I could give you a very long answer to this question. <laughs> Um, I, I admire, there are so many translators I admire. Um, one of the things that, that uh, excites me about the, the job of the translator is, well, there are so many things. One of them is that it's about being a writer. To be a great translator, you have to be a great writer. And the other is that even that isn't quite true because actually to be a trans great translator, you have to be... 25 great writers, because today you have to be Garcia Marquez, and tomorrow you have to be Cervantes, and the day after that you have to be Flaubert, the day after that you have to be a children's poet, and the day after that, whatever. So a lot of the, the translators I admire are the ones who are both extraordinarily good writers, really just as good as anybody, um, and the ones who have an amazing kind of versatility in, their, in what they're able to write. I'll just give you two very quick examples, both British translators, um, a little older than me. Um, one is a woman called Margaret Jewel Costa, who translates from uh, Portuguese and Spanish. And she's the translator of José Saramago and uh, Javier Marias and many other people. And she, um, she's an extraordinary writer. She's an extraordinary writer of sentences, beautiful sentences, and extraordinarily well-constructed bits of writing. Um, 
and I'm always very jealous of her talent because she translates the kind of books I could never dream to write myself. And then there's another woman called Anthea Bell who translates from French and German, um, who is my, my favorite example of, of uh, range, of, of uh, flexibility, if you like, because she translated W.G. Sebald, but she also translates Asterix. And she does both of these things with extraordinary skill and elegance and precision and you know subtlety and all those things. Um, but th there are so many though. Th I, because I, I try not to think too much about what I do when I'm doing it, it means that every translator who, whose work I think is wonderful, I'm, I'm slightly baffled by mm -hmm. how they do what they do. I write a little bit. I've written a few books. Um, I haven't written as many as I want to write because I keep being distracted by translation. But I was a writer before I translated. I'd written a few books before I translated. Um, I still write now little things because I write for newspapers and I write for magazines and that kind of thing. I write articles, and columns and stuff. I haven't written a book for a long time except to say that I've translated probably about 30 books and I wrote those as well. Um, it's a different kind of writing and it's writing with a very particular constraint, if you like. But all the books I've translated, I consider things that in some form I wrote because even though I had very strict guidelines about the, the content and the tone and that kind of thing, I was the one who had to look at the English language and go, how am I going to construct something out of all of these pieces, which is going to be a 110,000 word novel about a woman in the Spanish Civil War, or whatever it is. So they feel like, they feel like pieces of writing. In some ways, they're much harder than the other things I've written. Um, but uh, things that I've written completely uh, independently, if you like. Um, I've done a few, and I have plans for more, but I have to have a conversation with my agent. We haven't figured this out yet. Okay, uh, what do you really enjoy in translation? Um, I, I love reading, which is just as well. Um, but for me, the, the thing about translation which is exciting is more the writing than the reading, usually. Translating is those two things. You have to be a certain kind of reader and a certain kind of writer. Um, and the way I tend to work, uh, I, I, I do very, very quick first drafts. You know, at the speed at which I type, more or less. I'll do 5,000 words a day, first drafts. And they're terrible, completely unreadable. They're really just, I mean, I can't describe to you what they look like. Um, if there's a word I don't know what to do with, I leave it in the original and I keep going. It's just about getting something down on the, on the page. Going from that terrible first draft to the last draft, which is hopefully worth somebody reading. That's the bit that is fun for me. It's the bit that is the most nerdy and the most detailed and the most, um, you look at a sentence and you go, I'm not sure what's wrong with this, but I know, I mean, I can't articulate it, but I know that if it had one syllable fewer, this joke would be funny. It's the only thing it needs. It needs to have one. So it needs to get to that last syllable a tiny bit more quickly, and it'll suddenly be funny. It's those very, very tiny things that I love doing. Um, but all of it's a pleasure. If my job is, you know, reading brilliant books, and then having the opportunity to write brilliant books that I couldn't otherwise write myself. I could never write these books myself, um, but I kind of do, which is a, a huge treat. Please give us an, an exceptional or personal example uh, of a difficult translation or a word or something or a phrase that was really difficult. Oh, they were all difficult. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, one of the things I think you learn when you translate for any length of time is that um, translation is impossible. Uh, and I mean impossible very precisely. I don't mean it's very difficult. I mean, it's not possible. It's not a possible thing to do. 
Um, and that paradoxically becomes quite liberating, I think, when you realize that there is no way of producing an exact replica of something. There is no word in uh, Greek that maps exactly into the, onto a word in English. There is not one. Um, if you look at a, a very simple words, get, tell me a Greek word. <laughs> a nice, easy Greek word. Milau. Milau, I speak. So, already to, um, in English, I speak and Milau are the same thing, except they're not, because in English you need to have two words. In English you need to have a pronoun, um, which doesn't connect it to the verb in the same way that it does in Greek. Um, I speak in English rhymes with the word, rhymes with I seek, and it rhymes with the word meek, and it rhymes with the word uh, weak, mm -hmm. which in Greek it doesn't. In fact, it rhymes with the word Greek, for that matter. I speak Greek, um, whereas Elenika and Milau do not rhyme in Greek. So, the, so even things which seem really simple, the properties of the word, or of any word, are going to be so complex, because they're to do with precise meaning, but also to do with what they sound like, and what resonances they have and what associations they have and that kind of thing. Um, at the moment, I think you realize that, that everything, everything is untranslatable. That's when you realize that, that everything is translatable. Because all you're doing is you're attempting to find something. You're going to lose some things. You're going to gain some things. You're going to make compensations and add new things and whatever. Um, but I think you can make the case that any word is impossible really you can you can argue that you could argue that milau is the most difficult word to translate um but actually they all are but that's one of the reasons why when you're a translator you have to think of yourself i think as someone who is creative and who is uh not simply doing that thing which a machine does which goes milau what does the dictionary say the dictionary says i see i say or i speak and put it there and then looks at the next one and puts the next one there. Uh, writing is always much more, I mean good writing I should say, is more complex and more sophisticated than a series of words that are not really in relation to each other. So all of them is the answer, they were all impossible. Yeah. But that's okay. Translation is possible. But we don't mind. Um, I translate almost exclusive literary, exclusively literary works now, which is lovely. And partly it's lovely because those properties I was just talking about a moment ago to do with um, the kind of properties that a word has, the flavor of a word, the rhythm of a sentence, that kind of thing. Um, those are all things that are essential in literary writing. Literary writing is not principally about, I mean, this is kind of how I define it, I suppose. It's not writing that's about... Uh, it's not principally about conveying information. It's not principally about giving you data. The data may be important because you need to know the plot, but literary writing is distinct from other kinds of writing because it matters whether it's a one-syllable word or two. It matters whether it has big open vowels or whether it's very kind of closed consonants. Um, literary writing is the kind of writing where the writing itself is important. Um, which doesn't mean just fiction, it may be poetry, it may be non-fiction that is written artfully. Um, you can have literary history writing and travel writing and all kinds of things. Um, but what I think of as literary writing is the kind of writing which is defined by the writing itself having some, uh, having some uh, character and therefore that being part of my job to convey that character. Um, the kind of writing that is purely about uh, a clear way of conveying data, um, which may be technical writing, it may be an instruction manual, it may be a, a, a legal document, it may be whatever, which is to do with a precise... I mean, no one cares what it sounds like when you read it aloud. No one cares what kind of lovely alliteration you've used and what sort of rhythm there is. It's about being precise and being careful in, in the way you convey information. Um, Literary writing is, is more or less all I do now. Um, it's also the only thing I know how to do, I think. I don't think I know how to do any other kind of writing. Um, uh, for what reasons 
pronunciation point of view and what are your motives? Motives? Yes. Um, there are so many different ways I could answer this question. Um, I think there are two, which are three. Four. There are, I'm going to limit it to three. Uh, one of which is that it's enjoyable. It gives me pleasure the same way reading a book gives me pleasure. Um, and that's a kind of straightforward one. The second one, which is also straightforward, is uh, it's how I pay my rent. Um, this is actually what I do for a living, and I need to translate a certain amount. And I, uh, It's a very useful motivator that I know that I have to get through things because I've agreed a deadline with the publisher. I have to give them the book week after next, and they will then pay me some money, and I will pay my rent, and everyone avoids starving to death. Um, so there's a very practical thing that this is actually this is what I do professionally, and I'm paid to do it, and that's important. And then there is the thing which is uh, probably closer to the answer you want, which is uh, that I think most of us translate largely because um, we are, uh, how should I put it, evangelical about books that we love. Because there is something, uh, people who love books, anyone who loves books will recognize this phenomenon. You finish reading a book that you think is wonderful and uh, the thing that you most want to do is grab somebody on the street and say, read this, read this, you must read this. Uh, and I think most of us who translate have, a, have at least partly that as a, as a motivation for what we do. Because what we're doing is we're reading books that may be in Portuguese or in Greek or in Polish or whatever, uh, and making it possible for those books to find new readers. Most of the books I translate are from um, Portuguese is the language I do the most at the moment. And most of my friends can't read Portuguese. And uh, one of the ways I can get my friends to read the books that I have discovered that I love is to write those books again for them in English, to make it as, as easy as possible for them to get as close as possible to the experience of reading Portuguese, that experience of reading the book. Um, and then I can, I can evangelize, I can proselytize, I can uh, sell these books to them. Um, but it is, I think there's something, there's something quite sort of missionary about the whole thing. Um, I always think about translators um, as having this kind of common mission, I used this phrase yesterday. Uh, but I think part of it is about wanting to get books that we think are exciting into the hands of readers who otherwise would be obstructed from them. Um, checking about other translators, are you a member of the Professional Association for Translation of Translators? So in the United Kingdom we have something called the Translators Association, mm -hmm. which is our kind of union. It's part of the Union of Writers, which I think is interesting and symbolically quite important. The organization is the Society of Authors. Um, and within the Society of Authors is the Translators Association. It's not, it's mostly literary translators. Um, but I think it's interesting for symbolic reasons that literary translators are part of the, the author's union rather than the Institute of Linguists, for example. So I've been a member of the Translators Association for a long time. I chaired the, the, the Translators Association and the Society for a while. Um, and they're enormously important organizations, I think, to have the kind of solidarity in the face of problems, but also just to have a kind of community. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the union in the UK, the Translators Association, is about 600 mostly literary uh, translators. And there's a really strong feeling of, of, of um, kind of collegiality and mutual support and that sort of thing. Um, yes, it's very, it's very important to me. Please talk about your relation with the languages from which you translate. Sure. Um, I have, I grew up hearing Portuguese and Spanish. Um, my father was born in Argentina. My mother's from Brazil. Um, and even though I, I've only ever spoken to my parents in English, I still only speak to my parents in English, uh, those languages were around quite a lot because they had family and they had friends who would come and stay and that sort of thing. So I, I didn't grow up speaking those languages, but I grew up 
really comfortably, relatively comfortably uh, consuming those languages. And actually, that more or less carries through to the way to where the way I am today, because in fact, I don't speak Portuguese or Spanish. Uh, with any comfort at all. I don't speak them well or comfortably. And I don't write them well or comfortably. Um, but actually, that doesn't matter at all, because that's not my job. My job is a different thing. My job is to be able to read them sensitively and intelligently and so forth, um, and to be able to produce English. My, my languages of consumption and production are different, and I'm sure that's true with most people. Um, that my relationship to those languages is quite different. Um, my French is high school French. My French was at its best when I was uh, 17, probably, which is not recently. And uh, I do still translate from French, despite the fact that I have very elderly high school French, um, because I read enough French to be comfortable with that part of it. Uh, and again, my, my job is to, to be able to read those things, but to be able to write in English. English is my, my writing language. Um, I think a lot of people will assume that you have to have, you have to be fluent, meaning spoken fluent, in the language you translate from. Um, and fortunately, this isn't the case. Um, I do remember, though, a few years ago, I won a prize for a, a novel I translated. Um, which was written in Portuguese. And at the ceremony, there was a woman who came up to me and said, I'm from Portuguese radio. Could you do a live interview in 30 seconds? And I went, OK, OK, yeah, yeah, sure, fine. And I did this excruciating attempt to have a conversation in Portuguese, which I really speak terribly badly. I kept wondering what it sounded like to the people in Portugal who were told, this is Daniel Hahn, who's won the biggest prize in the English-speaking world for his translation of a Portuguese novel. Um, appears to be, first of all, an idiot, and secondly, completely unable to string a sentence together in Portuguese. But I think people haven't, don't quite think through, it's sort of obvious when you think about it, but they don't quite think through that there are very particular things you need to be, to be a translator. And one is to be able to read these languages, and one is to be able to write this language. And those are not at all the same skills. With the writers, OK. Um, I've been very lucky, I think, with the writers I translate, because uh, I think the ideal, the ideal scenario for it, the ideal writer uh, will be someone who is sort of obliging and answers your emails and answers your questions and responds and that kind of thing, but who also has some understanding of what a translator does and so they don't feel, uh, so they don't interfere more than you want. It's a very fine line. You don't want them to be completely inaccessible, but you also don't want them to be attempting to rewrite your translation for you. I've been very lucky, I think, that for the most part, I've had writers who have, uh, have been extremely obliging, who uh, speak very good English, but not so good that they think they could be writing this themselves. It is, a, uh, it is a risk when you're translating into English, much less if you're translating into Greek, that almost everyone I translate basically has some English. Um, and so it's great if it means that I can ask them to read a draft, maybe, or to answer some questions, or to discuss some issues. Um, but you don't want writers, I think, to decide that they are the translator of the book, and then you have to argue about every, every word with them. I've had some writers with whom I've done quite a lot of books, and then you kind of become friends over quite a long period. So uh, the first person I translated, the one I did for this friend, um, we've now just done our fifth book together. Um, and so we trust each other, and we, I know his work better than, probably not better than him, but almost. Um, and that's one thing which is quite nice, is developing. Probably half the books I translate now are by people I've had some kind of I've done some kind of work with before, um, and developing a sort of a kind of career-long relationship is really nice. Partly because 
what you're then doing is you're also giving the readers a sort of consistency because when the writer I just mentioned, it's an Angolan writer called José Eduardo Agualuza, his Portuguese readers always read him in Portuguese and now his English readers always read him in my English and there is a consistency to what I've done with his books. There is, he has a voice in English, if you like, the same way he has a voice in Portuguese. Um, and so uh, it's nice to have that, that luxury of being able to stay over. Like I mentioned, the writer earlier, um, the translator earlier, Margaret Jill Costa, who translated Saramago and also Javier Marias, she translates every Marias novel. So Marias in English is always Marias translated by Margaret. And there is, you can recognize Marias voice in English, uh, Marias sentence even in English in just the same way you can recognize it in Spanish. The editing, uh, I think editing is enormously important um, and uh, both for original books and for translations. One thing that's become very clear to me the more I've translated is uh, how little editing happens to original books in most places in the world. If I write a book in English and I send it to an editor the editor will say, this is a very good draft. Maybe you should consider the following things. So go away for a few months and come back having considered chapter three, you obviously think it's funny, it's not really funny yet. Chapters five and six, the subplot, the problem is the subplot now becomes more important than the main plot and that's unbalancing the whole thing the ending is a little bit too contrived, maybe think of a way of masking the way we get to. And so what you'll get from an editor in the English speaking world is something which isn't just making sure that you've spelled the words correctly. You'll get something which is really engaging with what you're trying to do. It doesn't mean they're trying to change it. They, they won't say, well, this thing that's a comedy, maybe you should take out all the jokes and put in, you know, a sex scene and a car chase. What they're doing is they're trying to understand what it is you're trying to do and make it as good as an, an example of that as, as, um, as they possibly can. It's a very uh, positive and benign thing. I very frequently get sent books that are published in, in other languages where clearly that's not happened, where there are really basic uh, continuity errors. And you're reading it through and saying, how did anyone publish a book in which this character is here and then they leave the room and then three pages later they're still in the room. Really basic things. I don't, I don't mean, you know, in, it's structural things. I mean really basic things that anyone reading the book should have noticed. Um, it's, it's striking to me that, that that very basic kind of primary process often doesn't happen with original books. With translations, the editing process is slightly different because the assumption is that they're not going to change the plot. You know. um, but even that does sometimes happen because sometimes if I'm translating a book that wasn't edited the first time around, the edit I'll get back from the publisher won't just be about commas and syllables and clarifying little phrases. Sometimes it will be, this really doesn't make sense, we're going to have to go back to the author and... Um, see whether we can change something that is that is problematic in the original. I, I think it's it's a shame that I know so many writers in so many countries who, because they don't have the habit of being edited, they'll they'll send their book to the publisher, the publisher will say, This is wonderful, you're a genius, we're going to correct your spelling and then we're going to print it, you know. Um, because they they then don't have that experience of being edited, they um, are slightly suspicious of it, I think. I know a lot of places where this is the case. And I think it's a huge shame because I think everybody can be made better by having, obviously, a, a, a good edit about it. It is horrendous. But what you want is someone who takes something you've written, which is almost very good, and they change eight words, and it suddenly comes into very sharp focus, like this image suddenly coming into focus. Um, it's an enormously pleasurable thing when it's done properly. I've 
I think I've been lucky. I've had really good editors. Um, how do you believe that quality translation can be improved? Um, how do you improve the quality of translation? I would love to know the answer to that. I think in the UK, which is mostly what I know, um, I think on the whole the quality of translation is very high. I think on the whole it's very high because um, I think we value th the right things, if you like, uh, because we talk about translation as uh, writing, not as a separate mechanical thing. I think on the whole it's quite high because translation, even though no one makes a fortune from it, it's well enough paid that you don't have to produce a book every 20 minutes. And I know a lot of places, um, a lot of countries where the rate of pay is so bad that translators are working so quickly that even really brilliant translators are producing quite mediocre work because they don't have time to revise anything. They, they are basically doing however many thousand words a day. They never get to read them again. They go straight into the, you know. Um, and there's much more kind of variation. Um, we also, I think, have the advantage in the UK that uh, the number of people who can be translators from certain languages is relatively limited. I mean, I was in, in Italy a few weeks ago with an Italian friend who's a translator, and she was saying that part of the problem is because everybody in Italy has a bit of some other language, 98% of the population think, I could be a, a translator a bit, you know, a bit of the time. And so the competition between them is just about price and it's not about quality. And there are some brilliant translators, of course, but even the really brilliant translators are having to work faster than is ideal. Um, so I think creating an environment, which we do, I mean, I, I, when it's not at all perfect in the UK, but in some respects I think we're okay. Creating an environment in which translators are, the expectations are that they're going to be able to write well. They're going to be experienced, um, sensitive writers, but also they're sufficiently valued by um, publishers and by readers and by writers and agents and so forth, um, that they're in a position where they can take their time and do things carefully and properly and, and still be able to pay their rent. That's the hope. Hope. To conclude, hope. Uh, I would like you to share uh, with us uh, your thoughts about your, the future of translation and if you're optimistic about it. I'm very optimistic in, in the UK, certainly. Um, the amount we're translating is increasing slowly. The amount our translations are selling is increasing slowly. Um, the rate of pay is increasing slowly. The contracts are getting slowly better. I mean, everything is moving more or less in the right direction. Um, I think the level of languages, the level of language learning at the universities in the UK is plummeting. But the level of language being spoken is, is going up because we have a much more diverse, much more multicultural society now. Um, all these things are against a backdrop of a lot of bits of culture falling apart, of course. So the fact that uh, we're publishing more translations and they're selling is great, but this is in a context where a lot of kinds of publishing are under threat and bookshops, a lot of bookshops closed in the last few years and uh, writers are making less money than they've ever made. Um, it's, a, it's a very challenging landscape in which translators and writers are working in the UK. Um, but it, it excites me. It excites me that there are so many uh, young people who come straight out of university and want to do this job, uh, which is relatively new in the UK at least. It's relatively new that there are people who are, um, you know, 20, 21, 22, or coming out with a master's a little later, who, uh, for whom this is the thing they want to do. I, I'm, as I said earlier, it's completely wasn't my experience, but uh, it's uh, people like that who are 
dynamic and passionate and uh, really driven um, are, what is, are why we're hopeful, I think. Thank you very much. Not at all. I hope that was all right. Good, I'm glad. Perfect. Glad to help. Thank you.